Good morning. Welcome to the second event of A Dream Deferred Black in the USA. Please silence your cell phones, and I will introduce now uh, my colleague, Professor of History, Marsha Shetland, who is the uh, chair of this symposium right now, this panel. Marsha. Hi, folks. Thank you so much for coming. This is a real honor and pleasure to facilitate this conversation with the next leaders in um, the black freedom struggle. And so I'll introduce our speakers briefly, and then we'll have a conversation about activism, platforms, and freedom. To my immediate left, um, featured in the New York Times article entitled, Our Demand is Simple, Stop Killing Us, Janetta Elzey, known as Netta on Twitter, is a St. Louis native who keeps us all woke with her on-the-street action and social media posts on the struggle. Moved by the moments after Michael Brown's killing in Ferguson, Elzey told The Atlantic, quote, and it just really hurt my feelings that on this day. This boy could not make it back to his grandma's house. His blood was so vivid on that road. The blood was just that deep. Next to Netta is Morgan DeBon, a St. Louis native who has been a leader since her days at Washington University, where she was elected student body president in her sophomore year, an unprecedented election for the St. Louis campus. An ever-present voice for black millennials, she is co-founder of one of my favorite websites, Blavity.com. Her commitment... <laughs> Woo! Her commitment to black gravity is nothing short of inspirational. Next to Morgan is Dere McKesson, a Baltimore native and now mayoral candidate. You may have heard of that. He is an alum of Bowdoin College and has spent his career as an advocate for children, family, and youth, as an organizer, an activist, and a teacher. Known for his signature blue vest and his desire to see black people get free, McKesson <laughs> devoted himself to full-time organizing and activism after the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And last but definitely not least, we have Samuel Sinyangwe of Campaign Zero. Uh, along with some of the members of this panel, he is a co-collaborator of the incredible activist resource, We the Protesters. He marries data and policy analysis with action on the ground. Among his many contributions to helping people understand this moment is my favorite from Huffington Post entitled, Stop Pretending the Ferguson Effect is Real. Please welcome our panelists. Panelists, I'd like to open up um, with the Landon theme this year, which is a dream deferred, black in the USA. Can each of you give me a sense of what you believe is the central impediment for the black dream to be realized in our present culture? So uh, before, I, before I say anything, I will say, you know, me, Sam, and Netta talk often. We love Morgan. Um, <laughs> but we haven't been together in so long. So this is like the first time this we've seen like each other This is like a cookout in a, in right a now. We're so it's excited. Really Friends. So what's in the way? Mm, I'll say two things. First, it's good to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. You know, I can, I get a lot of stuff every time I leave Baltimore, which is why I've not tweeted that I'm here, but I'm happy to be here. Um, <laughs> You know, one is I think that the landscape of hope in blackness has changed. I think that there was a period where people were really hopeful. Um, and, I, and I worry sometimes that that is not the case. I do think that there's some people more interested in fighting than winning, and that worries me when I think about the movement space sometimes. Um, I also know, and I've said this a million times, that we are not born woke, but something wakes us up. And I think that there's sometimes impatience when we think about this work. Uh, you know, I didn't know the police were killing people like this until Mike got killed, and like, that is real. And I think some of our work, you know, is understanding the difference between being woke and staying woke. And some people, like, get it today and don't get it tomorrow. Right. And we have to, th that's why the fight continues. You got a little fire over there. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's right. And then the last thing I'll say is, uh, this is really my worries, is I worry about the way that we create space between reform and revolution. Is that people, what people, you know, because people critique us as, like, the reformers because we believe that we can actually fix strict systems and structures like that we believe that at our core it's like why we did the data project it's why that i went to the street on august 9th it's why i you know got in my car and drove an hour to end up in st louis like we believe that we can fix some of this stuff um, and people critique us and say that this is actually not standing in solidarity with people of color that like there needs to be a wholesale transformation of the system and that and we agree but we just think we can do both and that if reform means that pookie gets out of jail tomorrow that that is good for pookie like and i say pookie endearingly as people in my family right 
They're just like good for people today while we work towards a beyond two-party system, that it doesn't actually have to be either or, and that people who only think about the revolution as this like a hundred year goal actually damage people that they claim that they stand stand beside, and I worry about that. I think that language is really seductive around the revolution, but then when you ask people what does that look like, it's always a 50-year plan that ignores people in the today and tomorrow, and you know, I think about our work as rooted in the today and tomorrow as well. Thank you. Anyone else? The impediment? Can I just add, I add on to DeRay's point about people and their fascinations or fantasies about the revolution. I had my revolution on August 9th, and unfortunately, not everyone came to Ferguson. So you, if you missed it, you missed it. But I had my revolution. I've earned my stripes. I've done all these horrific things, fighting the police and cursing out the National Guard. I don't have anything to prove to anybody. So if I feel like my way of getting black people free is the way that I go, then that's what it is. I think um, for me, one of the impediments is access to information. Mm -hmm. And so being from St. Louis and living in Silicon Valley at the same time, I saw you know, in the moment when Mike Brown was killed, it was a Saturday, and I was in it, right? Because I went to Wash U and I like, knew what was going on, but there was a huge disconnect. So my Facebook feed was like blowing up from people in St. Louis. But in the Bay, nobody knew what was happening and no one was covering it. Black publications weren't covering it. Major news publications weren't t covering it, like you know CNN or Vice. And Blavity was about, I don't know, three months old. We had like 300 users. I mean, like literally, like none. Um, and seeing that disparity of information, and that asymmetry, was just what made me quit. Honestly, I quit my full-time job. Um, and I think access to information is one of the challenges that we have. Sam? Yeah, I would say, you know, building on all of these points, one of the barriers that I see is our ability to move together and in solidarity uh, across generations and across spaces. So that means working with academia to not just sort of produce papers that only get read by other professors, but actually doing work that other people on the ground can actually read, understand, uh, and use in action. Uh, it means working with institutions, uh, and I'm talking about uh, you know, let's say non the nonprofit space, for example. Uh, you know, I worked before before getting into this work. I worked at an organization um, that was doing policy research and analysis uh, focused on inequity. And you know, on August 9th, the world changed for our generation. Um, but many folks who had been doing this work for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, just didn't see that, didn't feel it, weren't connected to it. Uh, and so there was this divide that formed whereby it was like business as usual in the workplace while the world was changing outside. And I think, how do we bridge that divide? How do we actually, um, how do we, and I'm talking we as, as black folk, really come together and figure out how to leverage the institutional power and connections that sort of the older generation has, but do that in service of the cause and the, uh, the movement that has formed and has been led by young folk. And I think that has been a huge challenge. I think there's progress being made, but it is slow. And you know, in this work, that we don't have time to lose, right? It's stuff, there is momentum here, and it's about how do you keep the momentum going? How do you keep this at the front of everybody's uh, conversation? And I think it takes everybody to do that. Uh, and we can't be distracted by you know, what foundations will tell you is important. Uh, or by what your, your board will tell you is important, or what these old legacy institutions continue to think um, is the work as the work continues to evolve on the ground. I really appreciate you focusing on your relationship to institutions because I think that each of you has found a medium in which your activism on behalf of black people can be highlighted and amplified. So if we pivot towards methods, um, because each of you is in a sector that is often criticized for being either too reactive or too passive, too outside or too inside. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, running for office for DeRay, for Netta, about connecting on the ground work with social media and chronicling it for people. Um, Sam, about numbers and data, and Morgan, um, your relationship to the startup Silicon Valley world. So I'll just echo what Sam said briefly. I, I do think that there are many people who want to be our parents and not our peers and our partners in the work. And I think that that is real. Um, I think that there are also, it's, academia is really interesting because people do the like, I know history, therefore I'm right. And you're like, well, you know, you couldn't have, what, what happened in Ferguson had not happened before that way. 
So you could have known all the history in the world and like it wouldn't have helped us when we were getting tear gassed or hiding under our steering wheels or any of that stuff. In terms of running for mayor, uh, raise your hand if you saw my picture on the front page of the New York Times website yesterday. If anybody saw that article. Well, good. Don't read really? it. Don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> don't read it. Never mind. It better. Don't read it. Do not, don't read it. Uh, <laughs> don't add <have> reviews. <laughs> don't read it. Uh, one of the interesting things about running for mayor is that I prepare, I thought that I was going to get a lot of critiques. And, you know, one of the critiques we get, Ned and I, is that we aren't open to critiques. So, like, anybody, anytime somebody says something critical of us, uh, anytime we respond in any way, it becomes a, like they aren't open to critique. So when I ran, I thought that we were going to have some real challenges around a set of issues that people were going to file a lawsuit against my residency, uh, that people were going to say that we couldn't raise money, that people were going to say that we didn't have volunteers. And all of those things essentially turned out to be OK. Like the residency thing didn't turn to be an issue. You know, We have 5,100 donors from all 50 states, and importantly, the third highest number of donors from Baltimore City. We raised more money quicker than any race in the history of, the, uh, history of Baltimore elections. right? So all that stuff's worked out. What has been fascinating to me is that what I can't get out of is like the simple critiques. right? So people every day publish articles that say, like, I really have never done anything in Baltimore. And, I, and it's like this interesting space that I'm in because you know I, I was an organizer in 99 as a teenager. I opened up an after school center on the west side of Baltimore. I trained a third of all the new teachers in the city for two years. I was the number two in human capital for the school system, which is a 12,000 person, billion dollar organization. And literally, like to this day, there are articles that get written that's like, DeRay has not organized in Baltimore. And you're like, and I'm sitting there like, I literally don't know what to do. Or people reduce us to the people who like stood in the middle of the street and we were the communications team during the protest as if we weren't like getting tear gassed while tweeting, right? Like as if we weren't also protesting. What do you think that impulse is? Because I think, I, don't know. I mean, I think, well, we, we know what it is, but I want you to say no. it. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to pretend like I'm asking questions. So just, just let, me, let me do that. Okay, help me out. Let's, let's dive deep into that impulse, right? So there's a, there's a deep di desire to reduce work, right? And I think that the more that it involves women and people of color, the less it becomes work, and it just, oh, it just happens, right? So in that process of running for office, how do you communicate those facts in that platform? Well, what's good is that the voters in Baltimore aren't reading this article in the front page of the New York mm -hmm. Times. That's good. Um, so done a lot of, I've been really proud of like the number of, uh, the number of voters that we've been able to contact. Like I've done a host of meet and greets in people's houses. Like people have DM being like, if I get my friends together, will you come, right? And then we go and you know, we hit like 40 voters at a time or people rent out bars so we can, uh, they can host neighborhood bars. Like, and that has been really powerful. And then knocking on doors, you know, we knocked, the campaign knocked 800 doors yesterday. We knocked doors this weekend, and a lot of people are undecided. People are really open. The challenge for me has been, you know, no matter what, it's going to be an 83-day campaign, right? That was best case scenario. Uh, and other people have been running for 183 days already, right? So was, the question was, how do we get in front of people? Uh, but there's been so much positive, and the platform is really strong. You know, of all the, I've gotten no critiques about any idea we put out. Like, you know, the platform is across eight buckets, and it is a strong platform. But it has been interesting to see the national profile doesn't necessarily help me in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. If anything, it really hurts me. So every time somebody see, you know, I met with the, C the CEO of YouTube mm -hmm. the other day, Susan, and people saw it and like, why is DeRay meeting with the CEO? And it's like, I'm talking about black people in Baltimore, right? Like it's not, we're not like, hey Susan, can we go get lunch? You know, it's like. Right, <laughs> right. And that's hard. Anyone else on platforms? You asked me about what? About um, connecting, I think it, it goes to Jure's point about like telling a story that can get out there because I think that people turn to you for, um, you have this incredible ability to communicate the complexity of the experience as it's happening. And so just kind of use how you use those tools or how you use those platform. Um, to answer your earlier question, I think the problem or the issue people have with how we use our platforms mm -hmm. is the fact that they never thought to do it that way before, mm -hmm. or they can't do it that way before, or they can't hold people's attention that way. Um, I know our dynamics are an issue for people. He's a black gay man. People erase the race sexuality all the time, mm -hmm. um, especially black women when they go after, you know, well, black men, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, well, he's also gay. So he's in your LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And what happens there? Or with me, 
you know, uh, I almost said something wrong. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me use a better word. Okay, so some black men. <laughs> that was good. That yeah. was good. Ooh, I was going to like, start I with the name. Right. I, I was going to like, was these good. motherfuckers. <laughs> um, um, they just really try me often, yes. <laughs> all the time. So I was tried yesterday in DeRay's little hit piece that came out on the New York Times where this man um, literally reduced me to a local woman who was on the communications team mm -hmm. and trick. I was there before people on Twitter knew who the fuck I was. Mm -hmm. And I was there before DeRay was there. I had, like, I'm from there. So right. how fucking dare you right. tell me that I was just you a know, communicator on the ground? No, Trick. Like, you DM'd me to get an interview saying my work was so important mm -hmm. five months ago. But because it went empty and unanswered, all of a sudden I'm just, like, nothing. So erasing your, you know, pre-August 9th life, is also a way, I think, of discrediting young people. Like, oh, they, they, they get woke one day and, you know, it starts there. And so in terms of thinking about your rootedness in, in St. Louis, um, what, what part of that earlier experience do you think people have yet to, to come toward? I don't know. I feel like everything has been attacked at this point. Um, mm -hmm. So people say I'm not from there because in the in my mom before she passed away, she moved us to the suburbs, and it was just like. But I grew up in a neighborhood where the sh house across the street from my house was a crack house, mm -hmm. and I went to public. Or I went to private school, so I would leave this all white world at five and come home and see the police like jumping out mm -hmm. on people. You can't take that away from me. Nobody can, which is why I fight so much. Like, he doesn't fight, and that's fine. Like, that's, his male, <laughs> that's just who DeRay is. That's his male privilege. That's all that shit. But for me, yeah. I'm like, oh, no, you come for me. You got me absolutely fucked up because I just gave up too much to be where I am. So I don't play with nobody. So people like come, like you either gonna get this hot block or you gonna get these hot 140. <laughs> or if you're like local, you might get these hands. Like, I don't care. <laughs> so I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not Coretta Scott King at all. <laughs> Just in case anybody in the audience feels like trying me, it can't go down. <laughs> all right, uh, you've been they put ready on today. Notice. Yeah. St. Louis until I die. <laughs> You have been put on notice. Um, so. Morgan. Yeah, um, <laughs> so you asked me about you know, Silicon Valley and some of the methods that I've had to use there. So for those of you who don't know, you know less than 1% of, of startups are funded um, by black women, or actually black people. Um, probably less than half a percent are venture funded by and founded by black women, right? So given those statistics, and given that I have a black, really black company with all black people who I love, um, you know, a lot of people are like, um, are you sure you want to start this? Are you sure you want to raise money? Um, and I was like, yeah, BuzzFeed valuation's a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, Vice's valuation's a billion dollars. Essence Magazine, <laughs> Black Enterprise, um, Ebony, Jet, you know, while I love all of them, they haven't transitioned to the way that we use technology today. Mm -mm. And the demographic of America is shifting. So from a business sense, this made sense, right? Like there's a, there's a clear market opportunity, right? Um, from a passion perspective, elevating voices was important to me and is important to me and everybody on my team. And so, you know, what was hard was hearing it over and over again that like it wasn't something that we should do because it's just so scientifically impossible to do what we're doing. And, um, you know, it took me like maybe six months to really be like, whatever, you know, I'm still going to do it. Like, I'm still going to go hard and raise millions of dollars and do what um, I see all my white friends in Silicon Valley do. And because we've decided to do that, you know, I think people are open to some of the mistakes that Blavity has made. I mean, you guys are criticized all the time. My DMs look a little bit different. They're either people um, trying to get a job, which I appreciate, or, um, <laughs> which, you know, is, is great. And then, or two, it's people saying, you know, Blavity shouldn't have published this, right? Blavity, you guys can't say this, or you can't say that. Mm -hmm. And my response is always, Blavity is not one person, mm -hmm. right? Blavity is everybody, and those are going to be a conflict at times. And so, 
Um, you know, not to say we don't have rules and policies and guidelines about what flies and what doesn't. We absolutely do. Um, but there are times when you'll have voices that can be with each other. And as long as it's an argument that's well thought out, that has a point of view, um, and often a clear call to action, then it's welcome, right? Um, and so if you read the comment section oh. on the site, it's lit. Oh. <laughs> the comment sections are ridiculous. <laughs> but read the comments on Blavity because they're actually really interesting. Are they good? They're so good. We don't get trolls. Are the trolls oh, attacked? Oh, how, like, how do you do that? Right. Because Blavity is so clearly for black people that those who come onto the site, they know what you're, they're walking into. But now trolls Facebook, are so well organized. Our Facebook comments is different because Got Facebook it. will circle outside of the Got world it. and people won't read the article. They'll just comment off the headline and what people said, right? But on the actual site, it's actually this really great community. And so, um, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Um, do you guys ever read you Very Smart Brothers? Yeah. 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 Right. So their comment section is very similar, right? It, you yeah. go, yeah. like, all like stuff on Very it. Smart Brothers, BSP. Right. Damon Young, it's, it's really well yeah. done. It's excellent here in Philly, or Pittsburgh. Um, and no. so I think by creating spaces that are very clearly for us, and that was the other challenge that I got from a methods perspective, is your, your demographic is too small. You can't have a hundred million dollar company and only service black people, and black millennials specifically. And I was like, um, have you heard of Brazil or <laughs> Lagos? <laughs> you know, right? So, um, you know, I think but being clear and having the, the flag in the sand that says like Blavity is for black millennials and black millennials around the world um, was how I kind of let go of, of all those obstacles that mentally were in my way. Excellent. And Sam, in the world of, of big data and using data towards um, justice, um, I would love to hear more about how you see that platform doing the work. Yeah, so I think we all tell our story uh, in different ways. And in many ways, that helps to translate to particular audiences. Um, and so, you know, following August 9th, you had nation nationwide protests started in Ferguson, protesting police violence. And what we continued to hear in the media was this story that, you know, we really don't know if these are isolated incidents or if this is a pattern you know, of police violence, particularly against black people. We don't know because the FBI doesn't collect comprehensive data on people being killed by police. And so out of that conversation, the best that, that policymakers were proposing is, oh, we just need to collect better data. Uh, and that's just not good enough. In a moment like this, you don't just, if all we get is a policy to collect better data, that's not the win, right? Um, and so what was true is that actually there were crowdsourced databases out there that were collecting uh, fairly comprehensive data on people being killed by police. And so you know, what we did was we looked at those databases. And in fact, according to the best research estimates, they combined across those databases, they were collecting about 95% of the total number of people killed by police in the United States. So they were doing what the FBI was not. The data was there, it was open source, just nobody had compiled it, filled in the gaps, and made sense of it in a way that could move the conversation forward. Uh, and so, you know, what we did was compile that data, data mo uh, merged it together, filled in the gaps around race, around whether the person was armed or unarmed, around which police department was responsible, the circumstances of each incident. Um, and what we found was actually that and this is, again, there's so many times that, that academia and uh, research institutions will put out studies that just confirm what communities have been saying for a long time. Um, but again, it's about you know, translation, this, this idea that there are, there are circles where, um, because of institutional racism, um, folks, particularly white folks, won't listen to what black communities are saying. They'll say, oh, that's just, they'll try to dismiss it unless they see quantitative evidence, unless they see it statistically significant. There are all these barriers that have been erected in order that actually silence communities and, and leave communities out of the conversation and leave them unheard. Uh, and so, you know, what we did was we found the data. And so we could make the case using the data. We could make the case uh, in li on live on the ground using tweets. Could make the case using video. There were so many ways to make the case. And I think the data added this element um, that convinced a, a certain subset of, of the population that, that something was going on, that it was a crisis, that it was systemic. We were able to show that black folks were three times more likely to be killed by police, that they were more likely to be unarmed when killed by police, that there were um, uh, four, uh, 17 of the 100 largest police departments in the United States killed black men at a rate higher than the U.S. murder rate. 
Um, so we could actually use data to tell this story in a way that was different and that appealed to a different audience. And I think that broadened the conversation and, and it particularly appealed to policymakers um, that really shut down their ability to dismiss what was going on. Um, and part of how to do that is to make it accessible, right? So if you look at mappingpoliceviolence.org, the first thing you see is this map uh, of every black person killed by police in 2015. There are 336 uh, markers on the map. And you look at that map and in two seconds, you know that this is a pattern, that it's happening all over the country and that it is a crisis. You don't need to read an academic study. You don't need to write a 30-page report. You get it in two seconds and that should be the goal. Ultimately, you need to be able to convince people in two seconds, in five seconds, of exactly what you're trying to say. And there has to be really sophisticated and hard research to back it up. But ultimately, your goal is to make this accessible, is to make, is to make the case to as many people as possible. Um, so I think that is, that is how we sort of use the data to, to make the case in a different way. I also think about how the data can be used to shut down um, false narratives about black folks. Um, so, once folks were convinced that this was a crisis, that it was happening, particularly affecting black folks, then the next sort of conversation coming from the right wing, coming from police, was, oh, this is because of black on black crime, right? They would try to blame black folks for the fact that police were out there killing them at a rate higher than the U.S. murder rate. Um, and so what we did was we ran the numbers, right? So nobody in the media had actually done the study where they looked at crime rates in communities and matched that against rates of police violence. Nobody had done that simple correlational study, right? They were just going based on assumption, even in academia, going based on assumption that this was somehow connected to, to violent crime in communities. Um, and as researchers, I mean, that is just ludicrous, right? You are pushing a narrative that is harmful to community, harmful to progress, based on no evidence whatsoever because it confirms uh, biases and stereotypes about black folks. And so what we did was we ran those numbers. We showed that there was absolutely no correlation between the rates of crime in cities and the rates of police violence per capita. Absolutely no correlation. There are cities like Newark and Buffalo where police are not killing folks uh, that have among the highest crime rates in the country. And there are cities like St. Louis where police are killing folks at a rate higher than the U.S. murder rate that have a comparable crime rate. And so this is clearly has to do with the policies and practices and the culture of the police departments that are resulting in the way that they respond to situations. Um, and we also showed that, right? We looked at the use of force policies of the 100 largest police departments, coded those up for whether they require officers to de-escalate situations? Do they ban chokeholds and strangleholds? Um, do they require officers to intervene when another officer is using excessive force? These types of things. What you found was that there was a statistically significant correlation between those policies being in place and having lower rates, making it less likely for police to kill people. Right? And so what we're trying to do is, use a, is translate this, what we know to be true in community, to research, to academia, to policymakers in a way that it just becomes irrefutable that these policies need to change, that these systems and structures need to change, that the responsibility is on public servants to actually serve the public and not to kill them. And so that is sort of the way that we use data, we, the way that we use policy um, to really answer questions in a different way. Um, and when you combine that with uh, the videos, when you combine that with on the ground testimony and stories, it really becomes an irrefutable body of evidence that change needs to happen. A lot of the responses to this question, to these questions have been about community and voice. And so as all of you are giving voice to communities, not only left behind, but actively alienated and disenfranchised, what role has your activism or platform played in amplifying those who have been silenced? And I think that's related to the issue at the core of this movement, um, which is state sanctioned violence. So how do you see your work helping to grow that resistance and how do you, where do you see that resistance going? I'll start. Okay. So um, for me, I see a lot of, there's a lot of emotional struggle. Um, I remember sitting in my all white office and I used to work at Intuit as a product manager and watching Twitter, um, Vine and Periscope was kind of, those were like the main kind of on the ground tools that people were using. And at work, in my cubicle, like, no one say anything to me, right? Like, don't talk to me, like, don't even look my way, right? And then, you know, I did the stupid thing of asking someone like, oh, what do you think about what's going on in Ferguson? They were just like, they had no idea what I was talking about, right? And so I think um, one of the things that we've tried to do is create a space where people can share their feelings. Right, because processing a lot of this is difficult. Um, and I think there's a lot of healing, there's a lot of anger, um, there's a lot of sadness, there's a lot of energy as well. And um, having 
a, the ability and a platform and an area where you can go and voice those concerns and voice your opinion and have a point of view and have a call to action and share your stories locally, things that aren't happening. I mean, I think about all the students at Yale, at Mizzou. I mean, there's just been so many things in the last 18 months that have happened because we've created these spaces for people to have a point of view and to share their, their perspective. And so when I think about the future, you know, I think it's about networks. I think it's about enabling people to share their voices and talk about whatever issues that th that may be. And uh, you know, state violence is obviously one of the ones top of mind for everyone here. But there's other issues as well affecting people of color and Black folks specifically. And so I think about platforms like Change.org, Twitter, Blavity, Medium. There's so many other places that you can go to voice your opinion and to network with other people so that they and you can work together to accomplish your goals, right? So um, I see more people flocking to platforms like that. I think as people of color, we've always faced these issues of erasure, and erasure often manifests in two ways. One is that either the story is never told or is told by everybody but us. And in this moment, we became the unerased. Like Twitter literally allowed us to push back on dominant culture narratives while talking to, to each other in ways that weren't mediated by anybody else. I think that was really powerful. Um, you know. I think that, and I think I'm really close to it, right? So I think I'm too close to it in some ways uh, to talk about it objectively. But I would like to believe that what we in us is like just, you know, some of many people in the movement space, right? The movement is bigger than any one person or two people or three people or one organization. Um, helped do was to tell a consistent narrative about this across the country. So I think about looking at Netta's tweets from the beginning when you know the gas station was still there and they were at one of the pumps getting supplies and think about like how that narrative has been consistent across. And I think that that's some of the feedback that I've gotten from people is that like when I go to different cities and talk about it that I can actually help people situate it in a context that is broader than this one city that it is about how these things link together. Um, and there is something about Twitter that, like, I don't know, I just get, right? Like, Twitter, I think about Twitter as, like, the friend that's always awake. Like, it is yes. just, I get it. You know, it's like, got Good it. Good morning, guys. Right, you're like, hey. <laughs> like, Twitter's home. I was just meeting, I just met with the head of cybersecurity at Facebook. And we were talking about Facebook. And, um, and I, I say all the time that, like, Twitter's home, but Facebook is, like, grandma's house, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, like, always, you'll never, you'll, you'll always go back to grandma's house at some point, but you don't want to be there all the day. All day. Uh, but Twitter is like that, Twitter's like home. And I do think there's something about the storytelling um, that allows messages to be amplified. And, you, and I'm also sensitive to the fact that the story that we're telling changes, right? Mm -hmm. that the movement is young. In the beginning, it was like nine months of, hey, everybody, not only is there a crisis, but the crisis is close to you. Like in the beginning, people are like St. Louis, and we're like, no, everywhere, right? But it wasn't until Sandra, Walter, and Freddie died that people were like, okay, the crisis is close to me. And then the story we were telling was that there are solutions, right? And then the story we were telling is that there needs to be systemic change. And I think about what comes next in the movement is two things. One is, can we build coalitions, right? Can we build entrances for people who might not have the same goals but have the same outcomes? You think about the gun control lobbyists don't have the same goals, all want to live in a world where there's not mass shootings. You think about the environmentalists don't have the same goals, all want to live in a world where the water's not dirty like it is in Flint. And then you think about the inside-outside game. I mean, it's like one of the reasons I'm running. Can we be as organized on the inside as we are on the outside? That being a battering ram on the outside will always be a part of the work. It has to be. But it cannot be the only part of the work. That we have to be on the boards and commissions. And like that has to be a part of our strategy, because the people we're fighting are definitely organized on the inside. Um, and the issues we're fighting are like so deeply entrenched on the inside that we have to be there too. I think from a policy perspective, um, we've seen so much change happen, right? So we've seen at least 24 states have enacted legislation uh, related to police accountability, police reform. Uh, we've seen public opinion shift dramatically in a way that we haven't seen really since the civil rights movement. Um, something like 70 million more Americans now uh, agree with the statement that more changes are needed to secure equal rights for black folks in this country than before Ferguson happened, right? So it's shifted from a minority position in this country to a majority position. Um, and we've seen more police officers get indicted than have ever been indicted, it's at least since uh, the past decade when data was being collected. Um, but yet it's still not good enough. It's piecemeal, it's small things here and there. Um, and what will be fascinating going forward, and I think the next phase is, one, how do we be more comprehensive in our approach? So you see states like Illinois, you see Connecticut um, 
Colorado actually enacting fairly comprehensive legislation related to police accountability, independent investigations, prosecutions, um, having clear rules about how body cameras are used so that they ensure accountability and transparency, um, limiting, creating an officer misconduct database so officers that are fired or resign under investigation, don't get rehired. Um, all of these elements are being passed in particular states, but we haven't seen that happen in you know, the majority of states. And then I think the next piece is, how do we ensure that these things are being implemented in a way that is effective, that is actually reducing and ultimately eliminating police violence? Right? So this goes to the, to the issue of who is it that is actually implementing these policies? Uh, can they be trusted? Are the tools and the, the infrastructure in place in order to actually monitor how they're doing and hold them accountable? Do folks uh, have, is it that we're able to open up uh, access ways for folks to directly lobby their representatives and to, and to know exactly how they stand on the issues, how they're voting? Uh, in order to hold them accountable at the ballot box. We saw uh, two prosecutors, um, Anita Alvarez and uh, McGinty in um, sh uh, Chicago and uh, in Ohio, uh, in Cleveland, uh, get deposed, right? They got elected out of office um, after, you know, failing to deliver justice uh, in the case of Tamir Rice. Uh, and then waiting on that Laquan McDonald video for 400 days. And so we're seeing now some powers being translated. We're seeing folks get pushed out of office. We're seeing presidential candidates get held accountable and actually propose agendas on racial justice, which we haven't seen uh, really ever, um, something specifically on racial justice, although it clearly doesn't go far enough. And so I think we're seeing progress, but it's just not quick enough. Uh, folks at, at the mass level do not have the right entry points in order to directly um, get involved in the political process. And I think so how do we think strategically about creating those openings so that in two clicks you can contact your representative, know exactly where they stand and push them to go further. Uh, all of that we have the capacity to do, but we still have to build those tools in order to make it happen. Would you like to go? <clears throat> uh, repeat about, the question. About giving voice to people who have been actively alienated um, around this issue of the resistance against state violence. Um, I would just, the only thing that comes to my mind is like the human aspect of mm -hmm. it is that it's really exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, always having to like read or see or hear or listen to like just oppressive ass shit all day. So. Um, I don't know, it's hard. Like when I want to just relax or tweet like the rest of my timeline, I still follow all the people I follow since 2009 when I first made my Twitter. So I didn't like alienate who I was before Ferguson. Mm. So some days I just want to watch TV with my friends, but people on Twitter think we're all friends. And it's just <laughs> like, well, I want to be over here with these people mm -hmm. and talk about bullshit on TV. Mm -hmm. I don't want right now to have to be on and like, hey, it's an emergency, it's a mess, blah, 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 blah. Um, I know that a lot of people seem to have this um, desire or want for everything to be like a big story or a big headline. Right. And it's just like, it's hard to tell people like, this isn't what you think it's going to be, but I can try to, you know, like I can try. Mm -hmm. People think that we just wave a magic wand and like the media just cares. And that's just, it's hard because people should know and the media should care and these stories should be shared and that's why we have places like Blavity or The Root or mm -hmm. um, all the kind of like the indie black news channels. Um, I don't know, I just, that's my biggest struggle is like keeping my humanity in a movement that doesn't want to see my humanity because yeah. I'm so visible. I really appreciate the point you make about the, the magic wand because um, when I try to explain to people that movements are work, they'll say, well, this happened and no one was there. And I was like, well, why didn't you organize those people? I think that there's a desire to reduce how hard your work is because you have computers. You still have to spend time with people. You still have to be in community. How do you shut down? Oh, I'm going to say, okay. This is not right. <laughs> Last point. How do you shut down a highway without connecting with real people, right? You don't do that without work. And so I think that I'm just going to, okay. So we have many students. Um, You've been thinking. Okay. Yeah, okay. She's ready. Where's, we your, where's, your, where's your think piece? <laughs> I, 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 just tr Blavity's trust me. Blavity's ready. Right. Uh, right. Blavity can post. I have, I have a lot of things. I have a lot of thoughts. Talk to your folk. Your <laughs> yes. So we have many students um, in the room today, um, and many I can vouch for are magic. Um, and they are looking to chart a course and orient themselves towards activism. Um, I went to the University of Missouri and I spent time with students there recently and they have a deep gratitude 
for everybody on this platform and the platforms you represent and the people that name, whose names we will never know because of the courage you gave them to chart their own course towards freedom. Um, so what advice or guidance or insight would you give students on this and other campuses about an orientation toward justice? I'll say three quick things. One is that this work will always be more important than it is popular. Mm. And you have to know that coming in. I, you know, I worry sometimes that people uh, see us, or they, they saw me on Colbert, and they, and they think that that is like every day, and it is, I'm broke, right? Like, it, people just like, they don't get it. No, say it, uh, say it, please, say it. Yeah, they just like don't get it. You know, they think <laughs> yeah. that it is, you know, it's, it's interesting running for mayor because people expect me to be the guy on Colbert every time. Like, I knock on the door and they're like, eh. And you're like, that is, I'm, like, I'm hungry, tired. right? Like, I'm like, <laughs> You know, got some snacks. The Colbert set is freezing, so it is. So you have to be, you know, alert because it's so cold. You know, so it, that is funny. Is that I think people, people, there's like a real disconnect there. That the work is important, and you do the work because it's important, and you do the work every day, and that's the grind. And then the other things will come. I think people think about it very, very differently. And I say that as somebody who, you know, my phone got cut off the other day, and I had to call, I had to borrow money to turn my phone back on, and I'm running for office, right? Speak. So like. So Speak people on. don't, I think people don't get that and they, and I think they see, you know, Beyonce follows me on Twitter and, and it's like, y'all, like, all of it is important and it's a part of the work, but it is, it does not translate into what people think, think it translates into. Uh, the second is that this difference between like organizations and infrastructure is that one of the, you know, people, people have a lot of critiques of me and that, uh, some of them that I think are, even though I disagree with them, I think they're fair critiques. Uh, but one that we get in that is probably like, I don't think that I'm fair, <laughs> is that I think that uh, this thing about, we haven't joined an organization, and we started Campaign Zero, but we're, we're really intense about, it's a group of us coming together that is, that's work with uh, organized from around the country, but it's not necessarily an organization. And it's because we are trying to help people understand the difference between infrastructure and organizations, that in St. Louis, infrastructure emerged. We became tweeters, other people became live streamers, the bail fund people came, like, the infrastructure emerged. There was no organization that started the protest. There was no organization that sustained the protest. But the infrastructure emerged. And like you can do work whether you're in an, an organization or not. Not to say that organizations don't have a role to play. They do. But they're not the only role in social justice work. And like I, that's, impor that's important to me because if you have an issue, you can get two of your friends together and like y'all you can build infrastructure wherever you are it doesn't need like a university id code and a bank account like you can think beyond the strictures of organizations you think about the civil rights movement that were born out of institutions churches and schools what happened in ferguson was like people coming out of their homes and like no more right like it was different and I, there's something true to that and the third is that, it re you know, one of my former mentors said to me, Dre, when it gets hard, just remember to do the work. And that probably has been the single best piece of advice because there have been some days that are not particularly great. Uh, and instead of reacting really intensely, like I just double down on the work and that has always proved to be the right piece of advice. Um, even when it doesn't feel like it in the moment and Lord knows there's enough work to be done. And I've seen people like wait for permission in this work and like you already have it. And you know, I think about, I got off my couch on August 16th, one o'clock in the morning, saw it on Twitter and drove nine hours to St. Louis, didn't know anybody in Missouri, put on Facebook that I'm going and I hope somebody can find a couch for me. And like that was my story, right? I literally was like, I just feel called to go. And like you can do that too. Like it was, you know, I just, it was, I wanted to be there. And like I met Netta, uh, she was, you know, she, we knew her cause she was on Twitter. And then we stood next to each other in a church and it was like, hug your neighbor. Ugh. And me and her, <laughs> that's not uh, to me. That's a, uh, no, to it's church. not a yet. Yeah. Oh, shade, shade. Uh, but anyway, we hugged, and that was like where we, you know, that was our, I know shade. That was our, <laughs> that was our story, you know, and like that is legitimately how it happened. Um, and I will. This is the last thing. The fourth thing is that I do think people are interested in. I know. Uh, people are interested in a scandal and not everything. There's not always a conspiracy theory like around the work, right? There's not always an ulterior motive. There's not always some deep, dark, like sometimes it is just what it is. And we have to like let that happen. I say that piggyback off what Sam said about how can we all work together is that sometimes the movement space is damn near going to tear itself apart. Uh, that we don't need other people to do it because the fighting that happens inside sometimes is so damning. And like we have to figure out how to work past that. Yeah, so I'll build on that uh, organizations and infrastructure idea. I think, particularly you know, as university students, you have a skill set that is really important and that can really be effective in making the case for 
all of the stuff that needs to happen, right? And I think you don't need permission to do that, right? So, you know, mapping police violence, like literally, I looked at this article that said the data was there, and I was like, okay, like I studied political science, I know how to do statistical analysis, and it, didn't, it wasn't even required, it was like basic correlational stuff, right? You just look at it and you're like, okay, like let's merge it, and then let's figure out how to visualize it. Like, let, let, let's look at these mapping programs. Which one looks good? This one kind of looks good. I'm not a graphic designer, but like, it looks good. So like, here it goes. And then connected with DeRay on Twitter, just like, look, I have this idea. Like, what do you think? Can we like work on this? He was like, here's my phone number. So then we got on the phone, launched it, and all of a sudden it became a thing, right? Uh, so you don't need permission for that. You don't need your academic advisor to approve that. You don't need to do that for your dissertation, right? Like, that is something you have the skill to do right now. You may not get your degree off of it, but you're going to help people and you're going to actually do the work that you want to do. I think that's more important. And then, you know, the other piece about it is there's still so much that is yet unknown, right? We just got the data on police killings, like, last year, right? We don't know much about it at all, really. We know the circumstances. We don't know, for example, among all of the policies within Campaign Zero that have been proposed in the President's Task Force report uh, or that have been proposed across the country, we don't know which three uh, have the, are close, are, are the best predictors of reducing police violence in this country. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know how rates of police violence compare to other social indicators, residential segregation, uh, educational attainment, all of those things. We don't know um, specifically what is it about the officers involved that could be good predictors um, in order to not get them, you know, not hire these types of officers or to have an early warning system. Like, we don't know the answers to these questions because the data is new. And you have all of the skills to actually start answering these questions. The data is open source. You just have to run the analysis and make sense of it, right? And I think that is a power that has really democratized the space, right? And I think that is the, the era that we're in is that it is now sort of a horizontal uh, leadership structure where you don't need to get permission to do the work. You don't need to get a PhD to have the skills to do the work. You don't need to um, know this person who knows this person who's that person. You just need to co connect to somebody on Twitter uh, who likes the idea, share your information, and then build something together. And I think that is a power that is new in our generation. And if we learn how to use this wisely, it will be incredibly impactful. Um, because now all of a sudden you don't have just a room, a room of people doing the work. You have people all across this country um, that are working together, collaborating, and have built this infrastructure to move the work forward at a pace that we just haven't seen before. Yeah, I'd add, um, don't wait, right? I mean, I remember in college people being like, well, you need to get a CS degree, right? You need to get a computer science degree, or like, you need, before I started Blavity, you need to go get your MBA. You know, those are better outcomes. And really, I think the theme here is that there is no reason to wait. You have a mobile phone, you have internet. That's all that you need to start something, right? Whether that's talking to someone, tweeting at someone, writing an article, building something, mapping something. I mean, at the end of the day, none of us can really give you your answer besides to say, like, we all did something. Um, and a lot of us have probably tried multiple things. Um, so starting and just, like, tomorrow, tonight, right now, like, that's, that's the best thing that you can do. A word. Word. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, I would like to open it up for questions. Um, and let me just make sure you understand the dis difference between a question and a comment. A question is a search for information wow. and knowledge. A comment are your feelings, which are important. But let's make the distinction and make sure everyone has a chance at the microphone. <laughs> I love that. Oh, shady. <laughs> you, you, sometimes you just have to. <laughs> And you can tweet us questions too. Later. Yes, and, and Morgan. there's opportunities on, <laughs> Not you. on, on <laughs> for everyone else but Janetta <laughs> to get some, some feedback on Twitter. Yes. Okay. Um, good morning, Joseph Rees. I'm your colleague from Howard University, and I'm really glad to be here today. So my question for the panel is, what would you think? Bless you. Bless you. Or rather, what are your views on, like, black institution spaces that want to use the Black Lives Matter moniker, but don't necessarily invite people from the Black Lives Matter movement to speak? I, I, I think, thank you. I think I have a sense of where that question is coming from. The odds, the, the tensions between black institutions and Black Lives Matter. Anybody? <laughs> 
the silence is deafening on this question. <laughs> you know, me caught up. <laughs> yeah, right. I do think that, so we always challenge, we challenge two things. One is this notion of like the front line, right? And we say that as people who got tear gassed in many cities is that we don't want to privilege people's proximity to trauma, right? That like you on the, black people on the front line everywhere, whether you stood in the street or not, like you were on the front line to the trauma and pain in America. Uh, so we are wary to create this space where it's like some of us are in the movement and then there are other black people, right? <laughs> that that is like a, a I worry about that. Um, so in terms of having panels that talk about this work, like, I'm open to them having a broad range of people who identify as people being a part of the work. It doesn't need to be only those of us who got tear gassed or stood in the middle, like, you know, I worry about that. I do think that there's a responsibility uh, to tell the story correctly. And that is what I worry about the most when I see these panels. It's just like you, you know, I think about even writers, and we, you know, we try not to talk about writers that frustrate us, but there are some writers who have said definitive things about the protest. Like, they have reported it as true. And then we're like, well, what protest were you at? They're like, none. And you're like, well, how did you, <laughs> like, literally, I don't know how you're on a panel about it. Like, you're on a panel as, like, an expert on the protest. And, like, that doesn't make sense to me. If you were on a panel about reporting about it or something, like, maybe. But that is, there's this weird thing where people who literally experienced very little of it become the, any part of the storyteller. And, like, that's, that, I think, is where, where I have an issue. Interesting. Yes. Hi everyone, um, my name is Anya and I'm currently doing my master's here at Georgetown in global health. Um, my question was or is how have you dealt with or handled the globalized nature that Black Lives Matter has become? Because um, I know for example I was watching a video on the whole fees must fall in South Africa, mm -hmm. that whole movement, and the, the Kabila 12 in Salvador, Brazil. And you know, these are things where people said they drew, they drew inspiration from the Black Lives Matter movement. So for you guys, when you began this, did you ever think that it, it'd become this global? And then now that it has, how do you handle or how do you deal with the globalized nature that Black Lives Matter has become. You know, I don't know if you guys know of Cecil Emike, and you know, she works on like black identities across the globe, and that's something I'm very interested in. So I know that you know, um, Americans and Black Americans have a huge role to play in, in you know in having this global voice. So I would say that for all of you on the panel, how do you navigate? you know, becoming more than just an American voice, but then also an international voice. Thank, Thank you. you. So I think for us, um, about 20% of our audience is international, mostly in London, um, South Africa, and um, Lagos and in Kenya. And it's interesting because just as you mentioned, you know, we don't, like our, uh, from the beginning, our voice was US black millennials, right? Um, and as we grow and expand, I think it's, it's thinking about how do we invite other voices and make sure that they have just an equal footing on the platform as well. And so, um, you know, the, the answer is that there's a lot of work to be done, I think, especially from a media perspective. Um, because as far as I know, I haven't really seen any black publications who have had mm -hmm. a big international point of view um, present. So lots of work to be done. Anyone else on that before I pivot to the next question? I think, you know, it's funny. We, so we stand in solidarity with people all across the country who are marginalized, I mean, all across the world. What is hard, though, is that they don't always want us to talk about their issues. So I can think about times where I've said, you know, I've tweeted something like in solidarity and people are like, you don't know, that, and it's like, you know what, so I'm, so I'm real quiet now. It took me a long time to find like the right people in other countries, like the people who like, if I retweeted their thing, it wouldn't be a problem. But I think about like a couple things, I, you know, Sam got me and Sam tweeted this thing once that said in London, um, oh. One, oh, it was bad. Oh, it was bad. Wait, which one was he it? tweeted, it was, it was like, what list. was the tweet? So I was pointing out the fact that <laughs> police don't shoot people to death or shoot people really at all in England and frankly in most of the rest of the developed world, right. which, is a, which is a fact, but. Right. And I retweeted that, people were living. I, like, to this day, I don't talk about black people in the UK because of that. Because people said to me, literally, like, it became like, DeRay is erasing police violence in the UK. 
And then when we asked for, so we said like, you know, I was like, well, what is the, is the data wrong? And they were like, you're treating us just like white people treat us, like you're not believing our experience. And it was like, I don't, and what was real, right? The, the real critique was that I did not understand the impact of the border police. I didn't get, I didn't know, right? And they weren't killing people, but they were inflicting like violence in a different way that was not represented in the numbers and that we weren't like adding texture to, which is real, right? But it became this thing of like, that we were like being malit, and it was like, I literally, like the numbers, they don't have guns, you know, like it wasn't this, I wasn't trying to diminish police violence anywhere else, but that was how it was received. And like after that, I literally, and one day I tweeted, like it was like a Muslim woman got pulled off a bus for being Muslim, and I thought it was here in America. And I, read, and I did a quote tweet, America 2016, and it was really the UK. So somebody wrote back, like, it was the UK, fine, right? So I deleted it, and then I just retweeted it. And people were literally in my mentions, like, why did you not retweet it, UK 20? It was like, okay, I'm done, right? So I literally just, like, I'm real chill. I do, like, a couple retweets. But, and it's not because I don't stand in solidarity, but I am nervous about retweeting the wrong thing. And there was another thing in South Africa where, like, Desmond Tutu's, like, niece or granddaughter or somebody was, like, protesting, but it was, like, against... The pro, like the fees must fall protesters, but I didn't know, and it was like Desmond Tutu's granddaughter. So I'm like retweet. I retweet like 15 tweets about her, and people are like in my mentions like he. And I was like, whoa, I'm so sorry, right? Like, so now I'm like real quiet about other places because <laughs> I really, I it has been totally in the best intent. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to like marginalize people everywhere, but it's it is harder than it looks. I think that's part of it, though. It's it's like that shows the thirst, right? It shows like mm -hmm. how poorly we've done as a country and by yeah. other people's voices in because we shouldn't have to be the representatives of, of the world, right? Like we should be figuring out how we can empower people like Cecil Mecki, who has amazing the strolling web series and get her to have an international audience. And how do we know who they are though? I think about yeah. you know like I don't I don't know, right? So I'm I'm amplifying the people on, that I see retweet on my timeline. Right. And then it's like what happens when you do the wrong person? I'm looking at Blabby like Blabby help me find out where the article is. Right? <laughs> Somebody please have the we article. Have them. I'm Ooh, working on it. Do you do? I love Blabby. <laughs> Can I answer? I have a, oh, please. I have an answer. Please. Um, you know. I'm gonna let them do them, but I'm you didn't at the beginning. Don't do that. That was shady. Shut your you up. didn't. She, <laughs> she's not being erased on this panel. Shut Stop. up. So um, <laughs> I will say something good about the international <laughs> black community. I, I had to find it. Um, when Ferguson first popped off, uh, there were several places that reached out to us globally. I don't know if all of them were black, but I know Palestine. Um, Egypt and Mexico City and Hong Kong um, all like reached out and were like, this is how you handle tear gas. That was the one thing that had us in common because our police in St. Louis travel to Israel, learn all their fucked up tactics and bring them back to America. So Palestinians had the exact same um, tear gas that we had in St. Louis, which is the same tear gas that they had in Baltimore. So that's how we connected. but. We didn't like keep up the connection. I wasn't like pressed to be like, hey, be my friend, only because I'm getting fucked up in the street where I pay taxes. So it's hard because a lot of black people are only worried about their neighborhood, their city, their state, their country. Um, and if you don't have access to things like access to information across the country or across the globe, you don't have a pass, I don't have a passport. So it's just like certain things just don't really come into my sphere because I'm so focused on me and what affects me and the people around me. Um, so I, like Morgan said, there's definitely work to be done. But in response to what DeRay was saying, I've watched him go through that because I just don't even, I don't even try. Because if people come to me crazy, like I just, something happens. So I just try to stay far, far away from that because I don't want to talk crazy to black people. You know what I'm saying? Like I love black people. Um, but I did have a guy from Europe somewhere who was, he was mad about Campaign Zero. And for some reason, like, DeRay wouldn't take the bait. Sam was like, sleep. Sam lived in, <laughs> Sam lived Sam in California. Sam always sleep when they go right. mad. They, they, they <laughs> mad. Sam You sleep. started this. Um, and our friend Brittany was like, I don't know, doing something. So I was the only one who was awake who saw what he was saying. And I had time. So I was just like in the airport going back and forth with him. Um, until he blocked me because I was just like, you will not disrespect me into or bully me into talking about your issues. And I was like, you could actually just send someone else and maybe we could talk.
So it's like the whole barrier of culture and like they experience white supremacy in a different way than we do. And it's just like all these things that keep us apart, which is really fucked up and it shouldn't. But if you come at me, you know, it's hard. It's hard to bully someone into caring about your issues. Mm. And that's how I've experienced most international black experiences. But I've had some good ones too. Dan? Yeah. Um, my name's Dan and I'm a sophomore. And just thanks so much for coming. I'm like geeking out and I've been like looking forward to this panel for a while. Anyway, thanks. Um, my question is, Netta and, and Morgan, y'all both talked about like the emotional aspect of this work and the importance and the power of the emotions involved. And, um, but I see a lot, especially from like people in Western schools of thought is like emotions should stay out of objective reasoning and can't be part of the argument. So my question is, how do you respond to people like that who say emotions aren't part of this work when they're obviously so important? Uh, the only time I ever hear that is when it's, it's usually from black academics on Twitter. Um, black academics are a special... No, they, wait a second. <laughs> are you all y'all special? Time out. Time out. Are you, I, I, like, what, what's the that. argument? Hmm? What's the argument that you're too emotional? Yeah. Or that emotions don't take, or people are like, oh, well, she's just really young. She's mad. She's angry, blah, blah, Because I was 25 when Ferguson mm -hmm. happened. I'm about to be 27, and it's just like, I'm not young, I'm mad. Like, I mean, I am young, but it's just like, I'm not a child. Like, I pay bills, I'm grown as hell. Clearly. Um, but yeah, black academics on Twitter are like a real special, maybe I'll just say everywhere, because I've experienced them on Twitter, on Facebook, on Tumblr, and I'm just like, oh God, y'all are just so much. Um, and it's like, it sucks because they're really smart. They do all these, this research and things that matter. Like I didn't finish school. So everyone on this panel has a degree but me. And I'm just always looking at it from the outside. Like what are y'all, why? Like why does it have to be so complicated? Why can't you just say what the hell you're actually trying to say? Why do you have to add 60 extra words to this one thing? Right. Like trying to sound extra smart. Like we already know you're smart. Um, and so I think the removing just the simple ways you can apply whatever this theory is um, makes people remove their emotions too. My ex-boyfriend is really brilliant and his emotions, he just couldn't emote. He was like really fucked up. And I was just like, what is wrong with you? Like, if you want to cry, my dude, cry. Like, <laughs> it's just stupid. Um, so it, it like really worries me because I'm about to go to school, go back to school in um, the fall. And I'm just like, I do not want to be one of these people. So I'm very like, I just believe in being very simple. My emotions have led me uh, many a places. Um, I have always just gone with what I feel is right and it's gotten me pretty far. So when people are like, oh, well, you should map out a, or draw a diagram or you need a, and I'm like, no, I don't. Actually, what I've been doing is pretty, is pretty good. I just need to tighten it up. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe learn some new skills. I can do that and still apply it to what I do or how I do it. But I don't have to go write 30 dissertations every day or have a Twitter fight with someone about, oh, well, you use this wrong. And it's like, you're talking about theory, and I'm actually in the streets getting my ass kicked. So fuck you and your theory, because you won't get out your ivy tower and meet me in the streets. So I just, I really have a, a love-hate relationship with academics. I think that was well said. <laughs> I think this is an interesting question about gender as well, right? Because there's a way that um, oh. women get yeah. discredited be, for being emotional, and, and then their emotions are what launches, right, a lot of the reasons why people get in. Right. Without the mother's grief, we don't have movements, right? And so I, I'm interested in the men, if you get Without this. the mother's grief, we don't have movements. That was good. That was good. So, that sometimes was good. we do it, it right. That was on Twitter. That was a tweet. That was good. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> that we was do good. it right. Follow that, my timeline. That. You'll that see was how good. it gets done. So, for, but I, I want to ask this gender question because for the men, where, where does then the, the, the emotion stuff go into the critique or do you even get that critique? My emotion, so, so <laughs> I'm part of the problem because I, I channel my emotion into sort of figuring out how to come at it using like the data and the research, but still do it in a way that is like not kosher, right? Like is in a way that like if somebody writes a fucked up article and they 
like on the Ferguson effect. I would do this on the Ferguson effect all the time because this idea would just get shipped out there that police are like not policing anymore and because police aren't policing anymore, like crime is going up so we really need the police to be killing folks so that they can keep crime down. That's the theory. And you know, there's no data behind it. Police were killing more people after Ferguson than they were in the months before Ferguson. So like there wasn't any not killing people that they were saying. They weren't testing that assumption. Uh, and then crime rates weren't even going up in any really statistically significant way across the country when you actually incorporate it. You weren't cherry picking cities like the New York Times was doing. So the entire argument was wrong. And folks would just push this out there. It was in the media. People were writing articles about it, using it to discredit the movement, yada, yada, yada. And so I would come at them directly and go, where, like, where are your facts? Where's your data? Why are you pushing this racist narrative? Uh, all of this stuff, like, directly, but it, but it was sort of more reserved. I wasn't just like, you know, I, I didn't say, like, fuck you, you're a terrible person, but I wanted to say it. <laughs> I would try to be like, okay, here's how the numbers are wrong. And I think in many ways, like some people respond to that in a different way, but some people just want to see, fuck you, your numbers are wrong, or fuck you, you know, you're a bad person because it's true, right? And so you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't be afraid of the truth because the truth is something that people will respond to regardless, right? And I think in many ways, the truth can look different to different people, but speak your truth, right? Speak your truth, speak it the way you want to speak it. Um, and be conscious of the ways in which, you know, folks, your own truth, like as a man, oftentimes, like I feel I have to sugarcoat what I'm saying in numbers and data um, because I went through academia and that was what I was taught. It was institutionalized. Um, and, you know, as Netta said, that's just, that's not necessarily true, right? They, Netta has spoken the truth, hasn't needed to do that, and still been much more effective than I had. At, at speaking the truth, right? And so she got a lot more followers than me. <laughs> Sadly. So you said it. we love you, Sam. <laughs> we love you, Sam. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so just speak your truth. Speak your truth, speak it the way you want to speak it. Um, and don't be afraid. Um, I was, oh. I, I, you know, I actually, I feel like I've gotten to be emotional about the movement. I feel like people are okay with it when it's about the movement, but I can't say anything emotional about me, right? So if I ever, like if somebody says anything and I like disagree with it, it like immediately is like Dorey doesn't take feedback. Or like I get that a lot. Um, so I think about when I taught the two day course at Yale. Like the, I taught this two day course at Yale. It was a new program. It had never happened like it happened before. Blah blah blah. It was very cool. Fox News tweeted it out and it became like this thing. And like the academics, like black academics, like took me to. I mean, it was like Durant, we worked our entire career. We don't know how to like this huge thing, and I like couldn't, anything I said to people, anything was immediately like, he's defensive, he does, and that is like a box that I get trapped in, mm -hmm. and, and that is really hard, that I can be emotional about everything but me. So, and as a candidate, it's been interesting because I can't even be emotional about me. So if I tweet like, I want waffles, people are like, he's not serious, it's not a real candidate. <laughs> and you're like, this is, you know, like it. Who doesn't love waffles? I mean, it's just like a real, or like Lego my ego, you know, it's like a, yeah. so that, so the candidate, the box is actually closed much more that I like, okay. if I don't tweet about like Baltimore, the police, and maybe like education, that it immediately is like DeRay's just running to like get more visit. Like it cannot be that I am actually a whole person who like also needs a haircut today, that like, you know, I just don't get it. And that is like a really interesting, and being gay is interesting because it's like important to people only when they're trying to use it for right. something else, right? That like it becomes the men are destroying the movement and then it's deray. And then it's like, well, <laughs> you know, queer people are leading the movement. People will be like LGB, but not, not whatever they put me as, right. you know, is leading them. And you're like, okay, this is just deep. Joy? Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, on behalf of my peers, friends, and classmates, we really appreciate your voices and your presence here at Georgetown. Um, so a couple months ago, I was introduced to the idea of FAIL as an acronym, so fit first attempt in learning. So, um, and I really, it took to me, and I uh, see failure now as, you know, something necessary to progress and growth. So in the spirit of not idolizing you all and kind of celebrating your humanity, what would you call your best failure? Whew. So excellent question. <laughs> yeah. great. I got That's a great question. <laughs> Try to keep it to one. Yeah, right. Right. Um, I got hellas. I right. 
tons. I started a startup in undergrad. I went to Wash U, and um, it was with four of my closest friends. And it was how many of you have this problem at the end of semester or end of the quarter? Depends on how you guys are on. You you run out of meal points, right? And so you're like looking oh. for things that have free food, or you're like hitting up freshmen to have bigger meal plans at Wash U. That that's what went down. Um, so, but we had so many events that had free food. Um, so we were building a system that let you search, and this was before like Facebook events were big, right? So you could search events and see which events had free food and then go to them because you were running out of meal points. <laughs> which was fine for the campus orgs because they like needed to hit certain numbers and so it was like a great exchange, right? Brilliant idea, so convinced. <laughs> but um, what I failed at was that we didn't organize very well. I mean, I started it with my friends and we were just like excited about it. Um, and we ultimately failed because we tried to make it perfect and it never launched. And, um, you know, I think it was a great idea. We could have gotten far. Um, but, yeah, it, we were just trying too much for perfection because we didn't understand that in the world of technology and, and, and innovation, you don't need to be perfect to launch. You can just be good enough, minimal viable product, MVP. One more failure story. I dropped out of school. And my grandmother cried, my mom made a real big deal, and I didn't care. Like, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I was really bored. School is just really boring to me. Oh, I guess just, I felt like I had other shit to do and not be, the schools I went to were all white, and I was just like, oh, this ain't it. Like, I didn't really know a lot of people. Like, I didn't have a lot of black friends there. And I just came home. Um, and got a job, but my mom was also sick at the time, so I just rather, like, my mind was everywhere else but in sitting in the classroom, but I learned lots of real life experience. Um, I was supposed to go back to school in August of 2014, but clearly I was out protesting. I was supposed to get a job in August of 2014, or, like, looking to get one, and I was in the streets, so I was just like, fuck it, and, um, my grandmother was like, she took my car for <laughs> So uh, we, at least for like the first six months, DeRay and I spent almost every day together when he was in St. Louis because I didn't have a car and he would have to come get me. Um, and I was just like, I felt like a failure because I pay my car note and you took my car because you don't want me to protest. Like, what the fuck is this? So it, we just had lots of fights. It was really ugly. I've never really cursed at my grandmother before, but uh, Ferguson inspired, you know, lots of new things. <laughs> But uh, I don't curse at her now. Like, you know, we, we back where, you know, where we should be. All right, we're going to take um, some of the, uh, tell me your question, and then we'll, we'll distribute them. So, oh, hey, how are you? How you doing? Uh, <laughs> my name is Javier Starks. I'm a hip-hop artist, youth advocate, and teacher working in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, I grew up in Baltimore. Uh, and so it's, uh, I guess this question is for everybody. Uh, uh, how do you feel that art, music, visual, whatever, will play a role in the things that you guys are doing moving forward, such as like campaigns that are obviously Blavity, you know, is like your outlet. But for someone as my, such as myself, we don't see as many outlets per se for those things. So I'm just curious, you know, how do you guys view that this, this how, could you, how do you see yourselves using artists and art itself to further your, your, your message or per se to just share this, you know, what, a, what I'm going to leave it at that. That's, I guess that's like the Thanks, question. Javier. Yeah. The next question. Hi, oh, hi. my name is Kate Chandler. I'm in the culture and politics program here. Um, and my question, I'm trying very hard not to give a comment, but I want you to sort of react, react to the ways in which the past 10 months with Donald Trump campaign has been one of the most racist past 10 months, especially in terms of the ways it's been presented in the media, using a lot of the same platforms that you guys are using, mm. including Twitter and Facebook and all of these other things. And so um, given the sort of ways in which this has dominated the white media, um, what are the responses that you guys have to this? Excellent. And the last question? <laughs> Yeah, th this is a Baltimore question, and I guess it, it's DeRay's intimacy that would answer to this. And it's, it's really about the image and the dynamics of Baltimore, the whole imagery from Inner Harbor to Federal Hill to African American Museum downtown to West Baltimore and the Freddie, and the Freddie Hill uh, killing. 
when we, when we got all the pictures back, and we have a black prosecutor, black mayor, when we get the pictures back of who were involved in the Freddie Hill, we see maybe half minorities in there. And is there, you know, thinking of rookie cops, thinking of the sort of the mentality of police forces and so forth, which adapt to maybe a, a majority culture, you know, just going along or trying to fit in or to try to rise or whatever. How is that dynamic? How do you feel that whole dynamic played out uh, among those members who are now being prosecuted by a black prosecutor for the Freddie Hill killing? You know, what goes on psychologically in the minds of those members of the police force? So we have um, three questions. One um, about Freddie Gray and Baltimore, um, the role of artists, and um, this thing called Trump. So we can start with whichever ones you would like. I like give a, just three comments. One is the Baltimore issue is that we know that representation alone is not justice, right? That like just because there are black people in power doesn't mean the world suddenly changes or that racism goes away. And what is interesting about being a candidate is that what I've come to understand is that there are two things in Baltimore that have held us back. One is that there's no strategy, that there are like resources, that there are amazing people and talent, but there's no plan at the city level. So people are working in silos. And the second is about scale. There's so many of our problems in Baltimore at scale, but the solutions aren't. So 70,000 addicts, 40% of our adults cannot functionally read, 25% of our pre-K students are chronically absent, they miss 20 days or more, right? Like, and we just don't have the solutions aren't at scale. And like we have to, if we don't do those, we'll just piecemeal the world. When I think about artists, artists are storytellers, and like we have to privilege different ways of telling stories. And like uh, what the people we fight against have done so well is tell these stories about whiteness as like as normal as what it means to be alive. And, to, and like art helps us tell stories differently. Like it functions as like a window and a mirror, a window helping us to see you know, what is possible and what is happening in a mirror in the sense that we like see ourselves differently. And I think that that is like what the role of art is. And then Trump's interesting because Trump is like a phenomenal reminder that, that it is about like the story that sells, not about the story of substance, right? Mm -hmm. And like, he is an incredible clickbait. He is a caricature and he has like mastered, you know, he, I see this as somebody who like does a lot of interviews, is that he knows how to talk to the camera so well. Yes. Like you know, he's not talking to the public, he's like talking to the camera, and he's mastered what it's like to talk to the camera. Trump will implode one day, and the question is like, how do we make sure that we're not a part of the collateral damage, right? Mm -hmm. Like for Trump to destroy Breitbart, for Trump yeah. to take out Fox News, like that, for Trump to like make the RNC something that will not be the same after his candidacy is incredible. I mean, that is, we could, the left could not have done that. Right? Trump did it. Right. But there is something about like making sure that we don't become the casualties. Like how do we not become the casualties of Trump, I think is a real question. I just want to say that I really feel like you wasted a question by asking us about Trump. Um, as in like Trump is not something that just magically appeared one day. On Twitter, on Facebook, his supporters, they've always been there. They just suddenly became Trump supporters because he's so vocal and visible and loud and obnoxious and just openly racist. But he speaks to other races that already existed here. So it's like, I don't even know what new there is, what, what's new to say about Trump. He's the same person who probably trolled Ferguson protesters. He's the same person who probably trolled the Black Power Movement in the 70s. He's the same goddamn person with his foot on Martin Luther King's neck when he had on a suit. He's the same person who was also an overseer on a plantation. Trump is not new. So I don't like really give a fuck about <laughs> <laughs> anything related to him because it's always the same white uh, white supremacy is the fucking same like it, it changes it shifts it, it diff like it molds to the way black people are or to the way the world is shifting and changing but nothing about him is new I really wish you would have asked a different question I'm sorry but Trump just makes me really hot and as a white person I was expecting you to ask like about allyship or um, you know how to be <sighs> Well, do you want Listen to talk about better. that? No, but these are just the things. <laughs> no, I'm just asking you. <laughs> this is what I was expecting, not like for us to have to spend time talking about Donald Trump and his raggedy ass supporters. Um, I could talk about art, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sam. I love you. Um, <laughs> so, I think ultimately, we have to conceptualize art as something that is like broader than what hangs in the gallery, right? Like art is the way that we visualize data. Art is the way that stories are told brilliantly on Twitter, 
right? Um, it is the, the pictures that are taken and how they capture a particular moment and a feeling and exactly what happened at that, at that point. Um, so all of that is art, and I think the power of art is to communicate things very succinctly and very powerfully and to appeal to people, to people's whole person, right? Um, and so, you know, I think about in the context of Campaign Zero, you know, we've been very conscious about how do we use data visualization to tell the story in a way that you just cannot with text alone. Um, and I think there's a lot more work to still be done in terms of taking that outside of the digital space and, and creating it in the physical space with physical art, right? Whether it is an installation, whether it is um, graffiti, whether, like how do we make it unavoidable? The fact that, you know, what Campaign Zero does really well is show that, that there are solutions to these issues, um, and here's what they are. Here are sort of the categories of solutions, um, and that they need to be, be pushed in a comprehensive way, right? Like body cameras alone is not going to solve this problem. Um, you know, changing use of force policies is not going to solve this problem alone when you don't have an accountability system to make sure police are adhering to it. Um, so I think how do we use art uh, and how do artists think about how to tell that story in the physical space so that people walking down the street are confronted with it in a way that they can choose to avoid on Twitter? Yeah, I would, I would add, you know, art has always been how we've communicated as a people, right? It's, it's one of the things that we can control. Um, and, you know, audio visuals, and it's incredibly important. I mean, I think it's a foundation to a lot of change movements and emotional connection, which ultimately drives change, right? So, um, for those of you who are artists, I mean, think of yourselves as absolutely core and essential to, to what we all do. Um, I mean, I look on Instagram for on hours just going through people's feeds and just being like, Jesus, like these people are so talented. And how can we take some of that talent and, and add the, the tools, the technology to help disseminate it. Um, you know, Sam, you're talking about the physical world. I think that's really important because then it gets outside of your bubble, right? Like Instagram, you can only go off of like maybe the Discover channel, but mostly just people who follow you, right? But if you're physically there, then you can't walk around it, right? You can't walk past the, you have to like not look at the building with the mural on it, right? Um, so I think that's really important. And to Trump, I think, <laughs> You know, Trump is just a constant reminder of like what we're fighting against. And I think, you know, for me, I was in denial for a really long time, mm -hmm. like of what was happening. I was. I was like, we're not gonna cover Trump. Like we literally had a no Trump rule at Blavity. And um, and a lot of other publications kinda had one, like Huff Poe had one, um, at BuzzFeed. Um, but you can't do that. You can't like ignore it because like there are legitimate people going to the polls and voting and even registering to vote to vote for Trump, right? And I think for most of you in this room, what's what our power is is that we typically don't vote. We talk a lot. We chit chat on the internet. We're in the comment section. We're doing this. We're doing that. But we don't actually vote. Um, and that, that to me is our biggest challenge and our, the biggest opportunity area for us to impact what happens in the fall and what ha impact things that happen in local elections. Um, it's registering to vote and actually going to go vote. Thank you so much. On behalf of Georgetown University and the Lannan Center and um, a generation, I just want to say thank you so much for spending time with us.